gut microbes play a huge role in health and in regulating health. It's, it's an area where we are just beginning to, to get an understanding of it, that the gastrointestinal system contains literally trillions of microbes of hundreds of millions of different varieties, most of which are, are beneficial or neutral, some are harmful, some are very important. And what microbes you have in your gut are influenced by many different factors. And they, uh, the microbes support many functions. They, are, they regulate, they break down foods, they synthesize nutrients from the foods, and they generate various factors that we need. They create vitamins, they create neurotransmitters, they, create, they have an active role in regulating hormones. And it is actually the microbes in the gut that regulate estrogen levels. And this is one of the things that we think is a key factor in lipedema because it, lipedema is so tightly linked to estrogen that we think the dysregulation of the estrogen by the gut microbes is a key factor there. So we talk a lot about gut dysbiosis, and they, there are ranges of gut, gut diseases. Dysbiosis is a, an unhealthy mix. It's not an explicit disease condition in its milder forms. As it, as it becomes more severe and the, the gut and the balance of the different types of microbes in the gut changes, then you have more symptoms and you have explicit disease and coming down to to, to the, uh, the, the explicit GI conditions where you may have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or, or irritable bowel, bowel disease and a whole range of, of conditions in between. And so this is a, a spectrum of conditions depending on whether you have a healthy mix of gut microbes or an unhealthy mix. You always have microbes, it's, that's, that's a given. Uh, where you have them, which microbes you have are the, the key issue, particularly what's in the small intestine and whether the microbes in the small intestine are healthy, whether they're able to, to leak into the bloodstream. And one of the things that happens in, in gut dysbiosis is that there's an overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria including E. coli. Normally there are small numbers of, of E. coli in the, in the small intestine and they're just passing through. But if you have a condition where the gut is out of balance, then you have these bacteria that become resident and you have larger numbers and these have a number of different effects. So that they, um, having the overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria promotes obesity and fat accumulation. And <coughs> gram-negative bacteria shed uh, these fat and sugar structures called lipopolysaccharides or endotoxins that are their tough outer shell. And they, they shed these, they enter the gut, they enter the bloodstream. These are not living uh, the, the endotoxins are not living. They can come in in the food supply, they can survive being boiled for 30 minutes, and they are the bad actors in all of this because the endotoxins cause inflammation. They're highly irritating. They're what the body rec recognizes as being, as being hostile gram-negative bacteria. And they also interfere with the pumping action of the lymphatic system. So that not only do they cause inflammation, they promote the inflammation and keep it from being cleared by the lymphatic system. And the number of factors that can contribute to an imbalance of, of gut bacteria, it can, it can be, become imbalanced from food choices, it can become imbalanced from antibiotics, it can become unbalanced from the effect of other medications, um, and it can be become unbalanced in, in several ways. So a lot of what we're talking about is trying to restore the healthy balance of the gut bacteria 
by minimizing fats and re refined carbohydrates, the sugars, both in quantity and frequency, having the fiber that the gut bacteria like to, and use to generate short-chain fatty acids that are the feedstock for your neurotransmitters and all of your, your regulatory hormones, and having healthy gut bacteria from fermented foods, particularly uh, kefir and yogurt every day. And this is our preferred route in, in, as opposed to, to uh, probiotics, is to, to rely on food sources of good bacteria. So when the endotoxins cause permeability in the gut, this, endo, this promotes systemic inflammation. Um, and one of the things that, that contributes to this is gluten because many people are sensitive to gluten. They may, have, they may have celiac disease. They may have gluten sensitivity. There are multiple forms of gluten sensitivity. The, um, and, and gluten exacerbates other food sensitivities and allergies. So it's a combination thing. Many of the people who are sensitive to, to some foods call, called FODMAPs it's actually, if they don't have gluten, they have, their sensitivity to these foods is much lower. So again, we, tr we advise minimizing or eliminating gluten, minimizing alcohol intake, and increasing inulin fiber from foods or supplements, as I spoke about yesterday. In lipedema and Durkheim's disease, these are are long associated with, with GI issues and gut permeability. And we, we, now, we now know relatively recently from the, from the uh, new article by, by Karen Herbst and Karen Beltran that there's such an overlap between EDS uh, hypermobility type and lipedema. And in EDS, as, as we heard earlier, there are many GI issues including structural anomalies in the gut and uh, many GI issues in people who are normal weight. So that um, this is a, a, a real issue. And they think there's some overlap here between what's going on in the gut, what happens with, with Ehlers-Danlos, and what happens with lipedema and Durkheim's. I think we need to really tease out what how all of these things are related. But this does seem to be a real connection. There is a very real connection. The incidence of, of celiac disease among people with Ehlers-Danlos is something like eight times the incidence in the general population. So food choices. We have taken what we have, have learned about the physiology of lymphedema and lipedema and Durkheim's and the role of the gut, tried to tie that all together and identify foods and, and classify them into, into different categories. Those that will, will feed these conditions and make them worse, those will, that will starve these conditions and, and help improve them. And we've, we've done this by looking at a, a number of other things. Literally everything you do affects your gut. Everything you don't do affects your gut. When you're not moving, your gut microbes sense that. They worry. They think things are not well, you're not well. They start to, to conserve energy. When you move regularly, they try and get ready for that. When you're stressed, they respond to the stress. When you have medications, they respond to the medications. So we're trying to find a, a healthy mix of activities and foods to maintain a healthy, healthy gut microbe to support the overall health of your body. So, one of the key issues on food choices is sh sugars. And this is not just table sugar. This is all of your highly refined carbohydrates that may be uh, in, in grain products as well, particularly wheat products. So these are the favorite foods of gram-negative bacteria. So they, they grow, they grow these, this lipopolysaccharide shell, which is, which is a, a couple of fat molecules and a string of hundreds of sugar molecules. And this is a tough outer shell that they create that, that shields the bacteria. 
that they then shed and it gets into the bloodstream and it, and it irritates the body. It, it causes systemic irritation throughout the system. Sugar, particularly fructose, also drives fatty liver disease. And fatty liver disease is present in virtually everyone who is obese. And that not only, that, that has several effect, effects. In terms of the lymphatic system, that greatly increases the lymph output from the liver. When the liver normally produces half of the lymph in the body, when the liver is diseased, the lymph output goes up by a factor of, of six to eight times. And this floods the central lymphatic system with, with lymph, overloading the entire lymphatic and, and leading to lymphatic swelling in all parts of the body. Sugar also changes the brain. It, is, it activates the same brain receptors that other drugs do. It is truly addictive and results in addictive behavior. So you get craving, you get tolerance, you get withdrawal symptoms, just as you get from other drugs. And you, you may you know, need to literally go, go cold turkey and cut the, cut the sugar. It's a, a very scary substance despite being so common. The other one that's, that has come to my attention relatively recently is a food additive called maltodextrin. This is a, another, uh, it's basically a, a, a sugar. It's a highly refined starch. It's cooked, it's processed. It's uh, used in foods to make them a little bit sweeter, a lot smoother. It's sort of a filler, and so it's in 60% uh, of packaged food products. It's in a wide variety of other foods. It raises your blood sugar almost twice as fast as sugar. Sugar has a glycemic index of 65. White bread and baked potatoes have a glycemic index of 100. Maltodextrin has a glycemic index of 110. Bacteria love this stuff. And it changes the bacteria. So when the, when the, when the gram-negative bacteria get the maltodextrin, not only do they grow, but they become adhesive and invasive. That means that they, they physically change. They grow celi, they grow hair. They can invade the lining of the intestine and adhere to it, and they can enter the blood, and they, and they enter the macrophages, and they then spread through the bloodstream and can cause infection in other places. These are some of the issues. We have taken, as you see in the book, a wide range of research on many different factors, looked at how they influence health and these disease conditions in terms of what, what's going to be better, what do you want, what's going to help and what's going to, what's going to feed and what's going to starve them. We've broken them down into an eating pattern. We don't say diet. We're talking about what you're going to eat for the rest of your life to maintain your health. So we have foods into three groups, but it's primarily a whole food diet. It's a plant-based. We, uh, the many other, other recommendations are consistent with this. We're avoiding sugars, particularly fructose, refined grains, especially gl gluten, and emphasizing whole foods, which is another way of saying avoiding the food additives. So we have the three groups. Primar eat primarily, it's, it's greens and beans and potatoes of color is the way I like to summarize this. Or you can have white potatoes but have the small potatoes. And potatoes are divided into two, two groups. They're what called mealy potatoes that are the big ones that are used in all the frozen potato products. And they're the small ones. They're different. The small ones don't raise your blood sugar as quickly. They have more fiber in them. That makes them what's called waxy. Um, so we also include fighting foods based on William Lee's work on how foods can counteract cancer and other conditions uh, and combat abnormal angiogenesis. So uh, vegetables, fruits and berries, 
not a lot of uh, melons, but more on the citrus fruits and the berries because the citrus have the flavonoids. We talked yesterday about supplemental flavonoids, but your food sources of flavonoids are, are primarily in the, in the citrus fruits and the berries. And fermented foods, things that, that will spoil, things that are sold refrigerated, particularly plain, unsweetened kefir and yogurt with active cultures. And some varieties of, of cultures can have, some varieties of kefir have uh, particularly beneficial cultures such as Lactobacillus ruteri, which is the gut microbe that creates oxytocin. We were talking about that the other day, the, the feel-good hormone. Uh, eggs and dairy, we, we recommend, other than the yogurt and the kefir, not much dairy, mostly as a, as a, as a uh, seasoning. And some eggs, um, poultry and, and fish, not a lot of meat. Again, avoiding the grains that contain gluten. Uh, soy, unprocessed or minimally processed organic soy, not the highly processed soy, textured vegetable proteins, things like that, that it, are not good. Uh, and snacks, you can have chocolate. Okay, we, we're recommend, recommending against sweets, we're recommending against candies, but chocolates actually have flavonoids. And the high, high the dark chocolates with the more cocoa are actually healthy for you. Look for the ones that are 70% or more. Um, we talked about Brazil nuts the other day, uh, other things. Beverages, unsweetened. Sugar-sweetened beverages are public health enemy number one. Public health enemy number two is 100% fruit drinks that are sweetened with, with apple and pear extracts that are very high in fructose. Uh, alcohol, not a lot of alcohol. It promotes gut, dis it, it promotes gut leakage. Uh, if you're gonna drink, a little bit of red wine is good. Um, and try and find foods that you can enjoy without adding sweetener to them. And particularly, maltodextrin is in most of the powdered artificial sweeteners. And this is as well as being an in infant formula in sports drinks and other things. And these are the things that you want to try and avoid. Uh, we limit fats. We go for the healthier fats. And we view nutrition as being an essential part of care along with CDT and everything else. Nutrition alone is not, is not going to cure these conditions. But if you don't improve nutrition, most of your other efforts are going to be very, very, very difficult. Uh, we have some resources here. We have the, the nutrition book. We have other things on the website. If you want to uh, reproduce the one-page summary of the, of the eating plan, that's available in PDF form on the website. Uh, other books in terms of, of other conditions are available. And my email is on the first slide, so thank you.